Hello and welcome to this clip exploring and introducing the electrophilic substitution mechanism as applied to halogenation of arenes. So just to recap on aromatic introductions you may have had, an arene is any compound containing an aromatic ring, or a benzene ring as it's sometimes referred to. This also includes benzene itself, obviously, and at any level apart from phenols, which contain a benzene ring with a hydroxyl group directly attached, all arenes are encountered are halogenated using the mechanism we're talking about in this clip. So although this clip assumes you've come across electrophilic substitution before, we'll look again very quickly at why carbon-carbon double bonds halogenate but aromatic rings apart from phenols do not, and also look at the electrophilic um, mechanism for substitution, but only the bare facts and uh, not go into the detail because I've already covered that on my clip on nitration of benzene. But we will definitely take the time to focus on differences in reagents and conditions between halogenation and nitration of aromatic rings. Okay, so here's a diagram that I've used in my other clip um, when I'm introducing uh, electrophilic substitution. Um, this time, why don't you put down the two columns I've got, pause the clip and see if you can make some comparisons of your own, and then uh, resume the clip to see if we're in agreement. So what I've done here is I've highlighted or underlined uh, the important sort of language you need to be using when you're describing the two differences. So electrons are localised in the cyclohexene but delocalised throughout the pi system in benzene. The localisation in cyclohexene leads to an area of an electron density that can easily induce a dipole, as you can see from the diagram, in the halogen. Uh, in benzene, this just doesn't happen because delocalised electrons in the pi system are not electron dense enough. There's not enough of them in one place to induce a dipole easily. So therefore the cyclohexene halogenation proceeds by electrophilic addition, whereas the, uh, the benzene halogenation proceeds by electrophilic substitution. So the main thing to remember in that it's a substitution reaction is that one atom or group of atoms, so in this case the electrophile A+, replaces another atom or group of atoms, in this case the hydrogen atom, bonded to the carbon in the benzene ring. Which leads us to our generic sort of uh, mechanism that we've got at the bottom that can be applied across to several different electrophiles. So what I'd like to try now is I'm going to put a tick by all the places you get marks for, see if you can uh, work out what the marks are actually um, given for. So have you worked it out yet? You can see that there's two marks in the middle and one mark either side within the whole mechanism. So the first one is for the correct curly arrow from the ring to the electrophile. The second one is to show the curly arrow correctly coming from the carbon-hydrogen bond to the open part of the partially delocalized pi system, the U-shape in this particular case. The third mark comes from the correct structure of the intermediate which includes the correct orientation the partially delocalized pi system, pointing the open end pointing towards where the substitution is taking place. And the final mark comes from the correct products, including H+. So don't forget the H+, which was originally attached to the benzene ring. Well, it's worth also pausing for a moment just to have a think about what happens to the electrons in the pi system. So we start out with six electrons in the delocalized pi system. Two were donated to the electrophile. So that leaves four electrons delocalized over five carbon atoms in the partially delocalized pi system. So I've highlighted the five carbons of interest. And I've also highlighted the carbon where there's no delocalization taking place at this point in the mechanism. So let's look at what happens next. So what the curly arrow actually shows is two electrons moving back into the partially delocalized pi system. So by the end of the reaction, or the end of the mechanism, there are six electrons again and the fully delocalized pi system has been restored. So what we're going to look at now is the creating the electrophile in the first place by a halogen carrier, how the electrophile is applied to the general mechanism we've just looked at, and then finally 
how we regenerate the catalyst at the end of the mechanism. So to make an electrophile uh, that will halogenate an, uh, an arine or an aromatic ring, we have to make a halogen ion that is positively charged. You're used to seeing halogen ions as negatively charged, such as Cl minus, uh, Br minus, for example. We need to make Cl plus or Br plus. So therefore, it will be able to act as a strong enough electrophile to attack the uh, the delocalized and stable pi system. So to do this, we need a substance that is able to break the bond between two halogen atoms in a halogen molecule, which is quite difficult. So these are usually trihalides of aluminium or iron. And the bonds between the metal and the halogen have some covalent character, so they can exhibit electronegativity towards a halogen molecule. So as you can clearly see, what's happened is the halogen-halogen bond has been broken to produce either AlCl4, for example, which has a negative charge, or FeBr4-. Um, and uh, it's just worth pointing out what's the halogen carrier in this and what's the electrophile. So once you've made your electrophiles, they're now ready to react with a benzene ring. So to do this, we mix the halogen carrier directly with the aromatic species at room temperature. Not forgetting, of course, the fact that the halogen has to be in there as well, so AlCl3 plus Cl2, for example. So if we apply this to the general mechanism we looked at a few minutes ago, obviously the Br+, plus, for example, um, behaves as an electrophile because it's positively charged and it's strong enough as an electrophile to attract a pair of electrons out of the delocalized pi system. So if you're asked to write the overall equation, you can actually use structural displayed or skeletal formula provided you're clear in what you're doing. If they actually ask you for a particular type of formula, then obviously you've got to follow the instructions and there'll be marks available for that. But you can see uh, where you'd put the identity of the halogen carrier if you were to do an overall equation, you'd put it above the arrow. The reason is because it's behaving as a catalyst, um, because it's regenerated. So we'll look now at how it's regenerated, therefore how it behaves as a catalyst. So if we take a look at the mechanism one more time, you can see there's a hydrogen ion produced at the end. So therefore, if you remember the reaction that created the electrophile, we also produce something called FeBr4-. Now the two highlighted species can react together to regenerate FeBr3. It could have happened with AlBr3, for example, as well, or even AlCl3 if we were chlorinating, but we're going to use the bromination uh, as our model at this particular point. But just bear in mind that you can apply this to either an AlBr4-, uh, or if you're chlorinating or iodinating, you change the halogen round, of course. So as you can see, we get the halogen carrier back and also a hydrogen halide, HBr in this case. Now if we get the overall equation that, that we looked at earlier, it must also show the HBr or the HCl, um, or the hydrogen halide, as I've mentioned. It's really, really important that you have the correct products, uh, as in two of them. Okay, so I think now it's time to try a quick exam question on this. So we start off by being asked to write the equation for the reaction of benzene with chlorine. So just like we've talked about, something like that would do the trick. Now, like I said earlier, um, you can write different versions of this. So you can write the uh, structural formula like that, and it's also acceptable because it's perfectly mm -hmm. clear what's actually going on. Remember we talked about C6H5 in class, didn't we, about C6H5 representing a benzene ring in structural form, so you could also put C6H6 plus Cl2 giving you C6H5Cl plus HCl. Now the reason I can do this is because it just says write the equation. It doesn't say what type of equation, it doesn't say what type of formula they want, so it's leaving it up to you, provided it's unambiguous. In other words, providing it's clear. So the next part of the question asks us how does the halogen carrier allow the reaction to take place? So it forms the electrophile Cl plus via the equation that we talked about earlier. So you'll notice that the equation wasn't asked for, but I put it in there anyway because it helps you make my answer clearer. 
It also helps support what I'm trying to say. It's always a good thing. If you can remember to pop something in to support what you're trying to explain to the examiner, then it's more likely that you'll pick up the right marks. So if we move the page down slightly. It then says to outline a mechanism for the reaction, including curly arrows and relevant dipoles. So I start by putting in my benzene ring with my CL plus nearby, my electrophile. So then I make sure that my curly arrow starts at the actual outline of the ring inside the benzene structure and points directly at the CL. So putting in the hydrogen that's going to be substituted this time and the CL, I make sure that the U-shape representing my partially delocalized pi system only goes up as far as the carbon either side of the, t of the carbon that's being substituted. In other words, no further than where I've highlighted. Obviously I need to place my positive charge inside my partially delocalized pi system. And now what I do is I show a curly arrow breaking the carbon-hydrogen bond. So the curly arrow starts at the carbon-hydrogen bond and it points clearly to the open end of the uh, partially delocalized pi system. So I now put in my chlorobenzene, which shows the Cl replacing the H. So my substitution is taking place. The fully restored pi system is drawn as a circle inside the hexagon, and not forgetting the H atom that came off and is now an H+. Now you've noticed I've just gone and improved the carbon-hydrogen bond slightly to make sure that the, uh, it shows that the curly arrow is coming off somewhere near the middle of it as opposed to the end. I noticed that last time. If you can see, it was uh, slightly ambiguous perhaps. I don't know if you can see from where you're sitting, on your phone or on your, your device, but I could have actually placed that curly arrow slightly better, couldn't I? So that's why I slightly extended my bond. It's made the bond slightly sketch-like as opposed to just a nice neat line, but uh, hopefully it can. I, I've taken the opportunity to, to show a genuine mistake I was making as I, as I was drawing. Trying to draw and speak at the same time sometimes isn't the best idea, is it? So they would now want the name of the mechanism. So it's obviously electrophilic substitution. You should be quite familiar with that by now. Now the next one asks us to compare the reaction of an alkene with bromine with the reaction of uh, benzene with a bromine. And it asks us, it's fairly open-ended this part, to compare the different reactivities of benzene and alkenes towards chlorine. So you can say benzene has a delocalized pi system, so the electron density is lower than in alkenes. So notice how I've taken notice of the wording in the question and make sure that my answer is comparative. So I've compared benzene to alkenes in my first statement. So my comparative statement in alkenes, they have a localized electron density between the two carbon atoms in the carbon-carbon bond. So this has higher electron density than benzene. So therefore, electrophiles are more easily attracted to the CC double bond in alkenes, and an induced dipole is more easily formed in the electrophile in the case of alkenes. So in this final sentence, what I'm doing is making a chemical conclusion based on the first two comparative statements that I made. And what I've done on purpose is highlighted key language or terminology that really gets your ideas across nice and clearly to the examiner if you're doing longer answers like this. OK, so once more, hopefully this was a reasonably useful clip for you to watch. Um, thanks again for your time and your patience, and uh, hopefully see you soon.